Hello, welcome to this week's episode of The Digest. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Francesca. Now, out of Zimbabwe on 19th February 1937, the fourth president to Zambia was born in a town called Gwande. His name, Rupia Bazani Banda, fondly known as RB. RB sadly died on the 11th of March 2022 after battling colon cancer for two years. Mr. Banda was an active member in politics since UNEP, where he held several diplomatic positions and was appointed vice president by then president Levi Mwanawasa in 2006. In 2008, after the demise of president Mwanawasa, Mr. Pia Banda was elected by narrowly winning opposition leader Michael Chilufia Sata of the Patriotic Front. This week on the Digest, we remember Rupia Bazani Banda. Professor Geoffrey Lungwangwa is a former member of parliament for Nelikwanda constituency in Mongu. He went into parliament in 2006 and left in 2021. Before politics, Professor Lungwangwa worked at the University of Zambia for 25 years in different portfolios. He was privileged to serve under Pia Banda's government as Minister of Education and this is how he got to know him. President Banda, I think as most of us know, is a household name uh, from independence time. Uh, those of us who were, at, who were there from independence, uh, we know that uh, President Banda played a key role in the different areas of our society. Um, he held different positions. Governor of Lusaka, as we know, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Chief Executive of Nambod, and many other uh, responsibilities. So, those of us who are old enough, we used to read about President Banda, uh, we used to hear about him on television, on radio, and so on. And for me, when I went to Parliament in 2006, that was the time when I closely, you know, worked with him. Uh, as a member of parliament and as a minister of education. And he was our leader of government business in the house uh, by virtue of being vice president. Kenneth Chpungu twice served as Rufunsa member of parliament from 2006 to 2011 under the movement for multi-party democracy. He was born on the 10th of December 1953. Kenneth served as district commissioner for Chongwe and Luangwa, appointed as provincial minister for Northwestern province and later promoted to cabinet minister under the Ministry of Youth and Child Development as permanent secretary. He too remembers Rupia Banda. I, I, I got to know him when he was appointed as a vice president uh, at that time under Manawasa, under MMD. And uh, he used to visit uh, provinces. There was this time that he visited us in northwestern province and uh, to, you know, to look at uh, the Mutanda Chavuma Road, to look at the Kansanshi Mine, to look at the Rumana Mine, and so on and so forth. So I toured with him the entire province. Uh, but the striking thing is that, uh, you know, when he, when he, when he, when he uh, you know, he was staying in the guest house, presidential guest house, and uh, when you go to greet him in the morning, he would actually want you to go into the bedroom. Where are you? So you go there, now you are saying, ah, this man, the president, he wants me to go to the bedroom. Now, you know, you don't know where to sit. So he said, ah, in the room. So I said, ah, this man, I think he's really down to earth. And for sure he was down to earth. Kabinga Pande, before joining politics, worked for Bank of Zambia for 14 years. He joined politics in 2005 under the leadership of Levi Patrick Manawasa the Late, who appointed him as Minister of Science and Technology and Vocational Training, then later transferred to the Ministry of Environment and before long was transferred to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Kaminga Pande continued to serve as Foreign Affairs Minister even during the reign of the diplomat, the fourth Republican President, Rupia Banda. So I started associating with the late President, Rupia Banda, 
From 2006, when he was uh, appointed as uh, vice president, I recall we undertook a trip to India together. You know, there are these uh, uh, health posts which are still being built, others are completed. That was uh, the efforts of the late president when we went to India. That's when that deal was clinched. I was there. And for me, this Pep's Cola company, there was some lunch. I invited the chairman of the company in India to come to Zambia. And when he came, President Lupia Banda told me to treat him like a king. We laid everything possible for that chairman to come. And uh, that's how the Pep's Cola company came into Zambia. At one point, something affected me. You know, I was very humbled. He, he did something to the Minister of Foreign Affairs over the weekend. I was not happy about it. So the following week, on Monday, Tuesday, I asked him for an appointment. He said, oh, come. I went to him. I said, no, Your Excellency, what took place, I was not happy. And he said, no, I hear you. Having been foreign affairs myself, I know how you feel. I'm sorry about it. Please forgive me. Those were his ways. How many presidents can do that? If there were other presidents, I would just have been told off to say, I'm the president. But he didn't take that route. To me, that kept adding on the respect that I had for him. That's why even after leaving office, I was among the first ones to visit him where he was lodging. And I continued my interaction with him. The last was before he left for this last chemo treatment. Two days before, I called him. Then he said, I'm going for about two weeks. When I come back, come with your wife and children. Let's have lunch together. Because the other time we went with my wife, we had lunch there. So that is the man. He taught me how to, to, to be a hard worker. And for sure I'm a hard worker, I'll tell you why. And, uh, you know, discipline. He taught me the importance of discipline. Yeah. Uh, you know, when he appointed me as um, uh, Minister of Sports, he gave me the mandate. Can you make sure that the Levi Manawasa Stadium is completed? The Heroes Stadium is completed. Olympic Youth Development Center is completed. And we must win. We must win at least a World Cup or qualified World Cup or the Africa Cup. And for sure, uh, within no time, within the three years, mandate given to, uh, to me. <clears throat> we, we completed the Levi Manasa Stadium. We completed the Hero Stadium. We completed the OIDC. And uh, Zambia won the Africa Cup of, of, of Games. Africa Cup, if you remember, we lost. And uh, we went to play, I think it was in Gabon, uh, three months later. The, the cup was, uh, was, was delivered to Zambia. So he taught me hard work and discipline because these are the two issues for any person to excel. I worked very closely with him by virtue of being a cabinet minister and by virtue of uh, being a member of parliament. So there are many many areas as it were uh, over which we had uh, you know face-to-face -face discussions and over which i got a lot of guidance from him let me begin with uh, parliament um, when i went to parliament like everybody else um, parliament is a different institution altogether it has its own way of doing things it has its own procedures. And there's a lot of learning to be done in the parliament. 
and the President Banda, by virtue of him having been in Parliament, having been a minister, he provided a lot of guidance to us, the newcomers to Parliament. He guided us in our private discussions with him and in other fora, in matters of parliamentary procedures, um, how to present yourself as a minister uh, in the parliament. So from the parliament point of view, I would say I personally, and I think most of my colleagues, we benefited immensely you know, from his wisdom, from his experience uh, about parliamentary procedures and how to conduct yourself. For example, as a minister, as an MP uh, in a parliament. Um, when it comes to the area of, let's say, education, um, when I went to the Minister of Education, in 2006, there were a number of problems which had to be, you know, confronted. Let me just give you one example. There were 17,000 trained teachers who were not employed. They were on the streets. And of course, I had a private discussion with him. Uh, we have 17,000 uh, trained teachers who are not employed while a number of schools you know have no teachers for example in the rural areas we have maybe one teacher per school responsible for six seven grades and as minister i would like to take steps to employ those 17 thousand you know trained teachers who are on the streets and of course he said well, that's very very important you know Whatever we can do to request the Minister of Finance, you know, to release money and give you permission, you know, to do that, we shall do it. And we went ahead in 2007 to employ 7,000 trained but unemployed teachers. That was 2007. No, sorry, 2006. And in 2017, sorry, 2007 we employed the rest of the teachers trained but unemployed 10,000 of them so we cleared you know, the 17,000 teachers uh, who were trained but unemployed um, just one example I give you uh, to give you um, there are other areas for example we put in place in the Ministry of Education a program for the construction of 100 secondary schools between 2007 and 2011. And that program was in our infrastructure operational plan every year. And each minister, every time I went into parliament to give a ministerial statement on the budget of the Minister of Education, Every member of parliament was given a document, very detailed document. The records are there at the ministry. This was done every year uh, when I was in the ministry so that we are transparent uh, in terms of what was being done. And also members of parliament can take the ministry accountable hold it accountable, you know, for the plans that was in place. And the President Banda was very, very happy, I think, with that approach. And he used to encourage, Minister, go ahead. This is the best way you know, to run a ministry, um, because what you are doing is public knowledge, is public information. So he gave a lot of guidance, you know, for me, as a Minister of Education. I would describe him as a family man. He was a type of a man who would say, you can mess with me, but don't mess with my family. That kind of character. 
And indeed, he was a peacemaker. Peacemaker because wherever we went as foreign affairs minister, I did travel with him to so many countries. And sometimes we engaged in very heated uh, debates at those meetings. But you would see his approach to issues. He applied a lot of diplomacy. He engaged so many of his fellow presidents so that at the end of the day, the meeting will end amicably. I recall one meeting at the AU when the late uh, president of Libya, who used to call himself King of Kings of Africa, Mama Gaddafi. He was the chairman of the AU, you know. Gaddafi had his own ways. He was uh, in a fast lane, what I would call a fast lane, to create United States of Africa. So at that meeting, we started the meeting about uh, 16. We went on midnight, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., we are still debating. At one point, he went away and only reappeared at five. I recall President Museven of Uganda becoming very upset. He walked from where he was sitting to go and confront uh, President Gaddafi to say, Mama, why are you treating us like kids? You know, we are not kids. Then he said, no. So the late President Rupia Banda realized that there was going to be commotion by the heads of states. Others joined now. So he stood and said, excuse me, please. So they all looked on the side. So who is saying, excuse me? It was Arabi. He said, no. If we start these arguments, we are going to spend more time. Since he has come, Let's carry on with the business. And that's how tempers calmed down. And we were in that meeting up to about six, seven in the morning. We reconvened at about eight hours. So that aspect of peacemaker. The other thing is, um, Arabi was a president who never had years of being a president. You know, he uh, was a president one would not want to fear, but one who should be respected. That's the attitude that I took towards him. And a good number of my colleagues in the cabinet took that line. His humility, we did not want to take advantage of his humility. Instead, we respected him. Instead, because there are some leaders, especially at the level of a president, they carry the air of being feared. That everybody, when he's, he or she's around, they must know that the president was around, but not Arabi. He was very humble. And as a result, we developed a lot of respect for him. I personally respected him so much. And because of that respect, whatever he wanted to do, or whatever instructions he gave, we tried as much as possible to follow them to the letter, so that we do not disappoint him, rather than having a leader who you fear. I'm sure he realized that uh, if you are a leader and you are feared, you will not get the truth from those, your subordinates. They will fear that, oh, if I tell him this, maybe the reaction will be this. For Arabi, he created an atmosphere where we were free to tell him what we felt. Even at cabinet meetings, we differed in with him as ministers. On some issues, he would bring an issue, and we were very free. 
Sometimes we say, okay, ministers, let's really look at the issue next time. Or there and then, he might say, no, I hear you. Let's take the course that you have. You have convinced me. Let's go this way. So that is the kind of a man. You know, he was a, a down-to-earth man. I think that's the best way, you know, I, I should describe him, down-to-earth. Uh, very humble, uh, readily to mix with anybody. You know, he was a peacemaker. He was a pan-Africanist, you know. Uh, uh, I, really, that's how I uh, how, how do describe him. And for me personally, he gave me an opportunity to work independently. I'll tell you, most of the times, if he was invited to other countries, like, uh, let me mention two, World Cup in South Africa, I went to represent him. And tell you, I had to interact with the other heads of state. Yes, and that is an opportunity that uh, I never thought I would, you know, come across. You know, he allowed you to do, as long as you, you do it properly. And the other time, there was a conference in, in uh, in Sri Lanka and they asked me to go and represent him I tell you uh, it's like uh, all the powers that are vested in the president when you are out there were given to to me I had a long escort from the airport up to the hotel so uh, that is the kind of a, a person but you must do what he wants you to do you know you guide you do this and you follow his guidance. And if you don't do it, I think he was a very hard man, for sure. You, you, many people did not like him. They thought he was uh, victimizing them. But he wanted uh, the job to move. President Banda was, had a rare personality. He had a rare, you know, character. Um, when you worked with him closely, you came to understand his, you know, his heart, his soul, and his mind. And I think this is where we miss it. Um, most of us miss it. When you work very closely with the president, you have to begin to understand the heart, the mind, and the soul of the president. That's very, very important, you know? And the President Banda was very, very patriotic to this country, you know? He had the heart, I mean, Zambia, deep in his heart. The love for the country, you know, was very paramount extremely loyal to the country and he wanted the best for the country and uh, you could see it in a number of ways president banda wanted to see you know unity in the country uh, peace in the country um, it used to come out for, you know when you talk to him it used to come out very very strongly um, and i think that was a rare quality and that, of course, as young politicians, we, we learned that from him. But it's very important, extremely important, to put the country first above everything else. Um, political parties, yes, are there. One is a member of the political party, and you work for, to see how best you can advance the ideals of your political party. But the ideals of the political party must be seen in the context of the, the country. And he put Zambia first in whatever he tried to do. And I think that is something you know, we learned from him uh, as president of this country. And. Um, he had a rare quality, you know, of humility and the love for the people. Um, 
President Banda is the type of person who could be at ease with a common person in the village, with a common person in the compound, and with people in higher echelons of power. I had the privilege of traveling with him to international conferences. For example, I went with him to the AU, African Union. I vis we visited Namibia together, South Africa. We went to India, you know, uh, the United States. And uh, if you were at the AU with him, you know, almost everybody who was there was actually a friend to him. Um, he was an international statesman. When we went, for example, to Namibia, oh, it was uh, amazing to see the welcome he was given, you know, by his president, uh, the, his colleague in Namibia and, uh, you know, other leaders in Namibia. Of course, you know, he was, uh, I think, president of um, the Nam Namibian Institute. Um, and he knew a number of Namibians, you know, who were at the time uh, in the freedom struggle. Um, so he was truly an international statesman of a very high degree. Uh, you can't take that away from him. President Banda had education at heart. Um, I think his, his own experience uh, had, to, had a lot to do with the way he looked at education. We all know he came from a humble background, you know, having received his primary education starting in Zimbabwe, you know, and later on he went to Ethiopia, you know, for his... Uh, uh, undergraduate studies, he were proceeded to Sweden for his postgraduate studies and so on. Um, he had education at heart. He really wanted to see education being, opportunities being expanded uh, to many children, you know, many stu you know, students. So access was prim primary, primary to him. Uh, he wanted to see education being equitable that is education opening its doors of opportunities to marginalized you know, children, you know, uh, disabled children, uh, people from poor families, uh, people from disadvantaged rural areas. He wanted to see equity within the education system, you know, the education of the girl child and so on. And he wanted to see quality education because, you see, just by virtue of opening doors of schools to children, it's not enough. Eh? What goes on in the classroom, the interface between the teacher and the, the learner is of extreme importance in terms of the quality of education. Because it's the quality of education which eventually determines how far one goes within the education system and the opportunities which come after, you know, after one has received his education, especially tertiary education. Okay? So he wanted to see quality education. And of course, the issue of relevance, the relevance of education you know, that is being provided. Um, he was very, very particular about that. Uh, he wanted to see more secondary schools, as I mentioned. Uh, he wanted to see more um, tertiary education institutions. It was during his time that Mulungushi University was opened. Okay, in 2008, Mulungushi University was opened. Um, cabinet took a step to construct a university in Chisari. You know, building on Mulakupikwa a police training infrastructure. Yeah, very, very important uh, because he, he was guiding 
like I've already said, he guided me that for us to have development, for us to one day to host the games or the football, which he liked so much, we must have infrastructure. So he guided me, besides this, we need to have uh, provincial stadiums in all the provinces. You know, besides these three, we had started also uh, Maramba Stadium. Uh, we renovated Maramba Stadium in Livingston, partially. And then we went in looking for a space so that we can construct a new uh, uh, stadium. And also, you know, he wanted us to have youth resource centers throughout the districts. Very important to give education or is it the experience or training to our youths in farming, in, the, in the electrical, in the plumbing, in the barbing and things like that. And for sure some of the uh, youth resource centers were built in this country and one of them is the Chiota Youth Resource Center in Rufunse beautiful infrastructure. And I think there is one also in the Copper Belt, the Chieftainess Malembeka. Beautiful infrastructure. Yes. So he guided all of, all of us. All the ministers were guided on what they are supposed to, uh, to do. You know, during his tenure of office, he commanded a lot of respect from fellow heads of state in the region and even at international level to the extent that uh, if there was a meeting going on whether at ministerial level council of ministers for which i was attending or at the heads of state level if zambia was not there in most cases, the meeting would be postponed or rescheduled until Zambia is there, so that they can hear the views of Zambia. All that was um, because of his expertise in terms of diplomacy. He was able to get to any president so these are some of the, the instances where I could say Arabi will be remembered so much. He was a genuine peacemaker. That's what I, I would call him. He did not pretend because whatever he preached, he put it into practice. Even within cabinet ministers, He would confide in you on something. So these are some of the, the instances where I could say Arabi will be remembered so much. He was a genuine peacemaker. That's what I, I would call him. He did not pretend because whatever he preached, he put it into practice. Arabi, as his message when he campaigned for presidency in 2008 read that he was president for every Zambian, president for all, all of us. And truly, Arabi was president for all of us, president for every Zambian. Um, he wanted to see Zambia continue with its peace and tranquility. He wanted to see a prosperous Zambia. He wanted to see a Zambia in which opportunities are available for each and every citizen of this country. Uh, and he wanted to see a Zambia that was an icon of peace on the African continent. In the effort to lift up Zambia, there were a number of development programs that were in place 
uh, during his time. For example, he launched the Urban Roads Project. The Urban Roads you are seeing today, they started during Arabi's, President Banda's time. The airport, Lusaka International Airport, Ndola Airport, Livingston Airport, these projects started during his time. The plans were already there. The toll gates you are seeing on the roads today, they started during his time. The toll gate system in this country was actually the, the program or the project was put to tender. It was put to tender way back in 2010-2011. Okay. When PF came in, in the government, they found that program in place. When you look at a number of infrastructure like roads, major roads, for example, Mongo Kalabo Road, President Banda launched the construction of that, of that road in 2010. In short, one could say President Banda had the heart for uplifting the well-being of our country, taking it to greater heights. He had a total commitment to ensure that Zambia is economically prosperous, is peaceful, is united for the good of all of us. And that's why last year, after the elections, he played a key role, as you saw, to bring President Hakainde, President Lungu, to bring them together. And I'm sure he advised them that let us take Zambia first. Zambia comes first. All of us should work for the good of our people. And you, we saw the tra a peaceful transition of leadership in our country. And uh, that we should all be grateful. And uh, as we mourn him, we should remember that he had the heart for this country. And may, of course, his soul rest in peace. You know, Arabi was a, a man of the people, isn't it? He was a family man, and he loved everybody. Uh, he had so many friends. He was our leader. He was our president. He was our ambassador. You know, he held the number of portfolios in this country. So I, I, for me, I would ask all the, the face of all the family members to emulate what he stood for in this country. I wish the children should not uh, depart from his uh, uh, character. You know, and then for the rest of us, let's mourn him peacefully. In our own minds, let's keep on remem remembering the, the, the president, uh, Mr. Rupia Buzan Banda, you know, until such a time. And we should not be fighting, we should not be doing things that are detrimental to our peace and security in this country. So let us maintain uh, unity, let us maintain peace. Very important indeed, as we mourn our president. It's unfortunate that he died, but of course, what do you do, you know? But uh, this country really has lost a great person, a unifier. I'm sure you saw what happened, with, you know, in the last elections. He had to bring the two warring parties, you know, together. During our time, you know, of course, it's not easy to, to accept defeat, but he accepted. You know, most of us won in 2011, most of the MPs, we won our seats. It's him who lost. So that's why in parliament we had more members of parliament uh, than the opposition, than the ruling government. But he went there and accepted the defeat and announced that you know he was stepping down. That he must be respected by all people in this country, including other African nations. And the world at large, yes. I've heard so many people, a lot of wonderful eulogies about him, peacemaker. 
maybe at this juncture I can say my appeal, my earnest appeal to Zambians, and particularly the politicians, those who are in politics. We've, so, we've said so much wonderful things about Arabi. To truly mean what we've been saying about him, can we put those things into practice? Can we do that? He was a Democrat, can we all be Democrats? He was a peacemaker, can we all be peacemakers? He wanted unity in this country, can we all be people looking for unity to make unity in this country? Then whatever we are saying will make sense. And not where we say things about somebody because he's gone, and we don't put those things into practice. To me, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't at all. So even for the people, to the people of Zambia, those examples we are giving about Rwanda, once peace evaporates from a country, you will never have it. Again, it reminds me of late Gaddafi. About peace, he was saying, in countries where peace has gone, it's very difficult to restore it. He gave the examples of Somalia. Since the departure of Siad Bere, there's never been a true peace in Somalia. He talked about DRC Congo. Since the departure of Mobutu, there's never been peace. Iraq, since the departure of Saddam Hussein, despite whatever he was doing, there's never been peace. There are many examples. So Zambia is a haven of peace. Let's maintain it. And it's only us, Zambians ourselves, who can do that. And uh, may I also, at this juncture, commend the current president, Haka Inde Hichilema, for stating that is going to involve the former president, Ediga Chagwalung, in the morning of Arabi, in the barrio arrangements of Arabi. My appeal to my brother, I call him my brother, HH, is that it should not end there. It should be a turning point for the two HH and ECL to get together. Because he's the only one remaining. While he's still there, let's cherish him. Because we have a tendency, maybe it's human nature. If you had this something, you know, you would be doing everything so good to me. You just make one mistake. What will be pronounced more is that simple mistake. Why don't we dwell on good things that people do? Why don't we spend more time on what people do? That is what we should be doing. So in my view, we have remained with Edgar Chagwalungu. Whether we like it or not, is the former president and the HH, who definitely need the counsel from him, is been there where he is. And it is incumbent upon the sitting president to extend that olive branch to the former president. And the Zambians, as people of this country, who follow. Of course, they might be divergent for uh, views, but the back stops at HH, my brother. Rupia Banda is survived by second wife Tandiwe Banda and seven children. 
Mr. Banda, who ruled from 2008 to 2011, was the second president in Zambia to have his immunity removed. However, he was very instrumental in 2021 August in mediating a smooth power transition between incumbent Edgar Lungu and the current president, Hakainde Hichilema. And that gesture was seen as his last significant contribution for the country. Now, you can give us your feedback on this program by emailing us at documentaries at DamonTVZambia.com or you can simply drop us an inbox on our Facebook page at Damon TV Zambia. Thank you so much for the pleasure of your company. Stay blessed.